All right, guys, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about player input and player movement. Uh, the code is not very involved, but there's a lot of stuff going on in the background here. And so we'll just uh, skim through some of the official docs here. So the way that uh, inputs work in netcode for entities here is there is a command stream that is constantly being sent from the clients to the server. And this command stream is going to be sent even if there's no commands to be sent. So even just acknowledgments of uh, the previous go snapshots will always get sent every tick. So I think 60 times a second is the default uh, tick rate here. So to actually send inputs, we need to create a special component um, called I command data. Uh, there's also going to be an automated way to set this up as well. And that's the way that's we're doing it in the code. But we want to look into how this actually works. There's a lot of code generation going on in the background. So basically what we do is uh, every update we'll pull our, our inputs and we save that into the command data struct. And this is a, it was actually a dynamic buffer uh, in the background that it is constantly adding to and then sending every tick. So this is important um, because to fight against uh, packet loss. So in case a random packet gets lost, you're not, you don't actually lose your input data for that tick, uh, because it, there is redundancy set up. So the last three ticks, uh, will get, um, Delta compressed and then sent with the current tick. You'll you see that here. This is what the full packet would actually look like. So you have uh, the current command and then the difference between uh, this tick and the last tick, the one before that and the one before that. And this is important uh, because there's an actual size limit for this command payload and that's one kilobyte. Uh, I can't think of a reason for your commands to get anywhere near one kilobyte, um, but it is it is there. And you'll get errors if uh, if you surpass that. Maybe if you're doing like something crazy like hand tracking in VR, uh, you might want to send like the hand data as a command, but that gets out of hand quickly. So that's on the client side. And on the server side, there is a command receive system that is automatically set up to receive these commands and then route them to their proper entities. So the automatic part that we set up, um, we did this last time here in our ghost. Uh, we have to have uh, the has owner set up and this gets set when we actually uh, spawn our, our player. And you'll also can have this support auto command target. So this will automatically route the commands from this uh, client to this particular uh, entity. Uh, you can set this um, at runtime. You don't have to do it in the uh, editor here at, at uh, the author time or at baking. So if you do set this 
um, at runtime later. You just need to make sure that it is set on the client and the server as well. So after we actually send our commands, uh, the server has to know which entity is which. And this is part of what that uh, has owner will set for you. Here you can either check the ghost owner is one of the uh, components you can actually look up. Um, but there is a tag for here. Ghost owner is local. Um, that's kind of the way it's set up for you. And it's, it's just the easiest way to, to, to go about checking for uh, your local player. All right, uh, so we can actually start looking at some of the code here. And uh, there is a uh, I input component data uh, that we're going to be using. That is what is used for that uh, auto command system. Um, it's baked by the I command data, so you still have to respect that one kilobyte limit for it. All right, so this is going to be what our actual player input will look like here. Uh, this is what is on our ghost. And we just set the ghost component type here to uh, all predicted. So basically all of our predicted ghosts will get this player input and the interpolated ghosts will not get this, which is important for your like remote players uh, won't be getting player input. And yeah, it just gets baked out normally um, I believe in the code generation, this all gets set to um, leaves a dynamic buffer for the I command system. Oh yeah. So here uh, we're using uh, the actual input system. So our movement it's going to be a uh, float to uh, look. I'm not actually using this, but it's also a float to in uh, in the input system for our fire button. Uh, this is using a special struct for uh, input event. And what this does is this just ensures that your fire event when it goes off, it's uh, only going to go off once per uh, per network tick when it gets sent. So you don't get like double and triple fires. So this is on the client side um, system here. So we're just, this is how we're going to be getting our player input. And here it updates in the group uh, ghost input system group. And we have it set to uh, only run on our client simulation. Server doesn't have inputs, it doesn't care. Uh, here we are using system base uh, because our, our action map here is a managed class. This uh, default input actions is um, built in. It comes with the input system. Uh, we can see that in our packages. Here, input system. Oh, 
plugin, and I believe it was. And yeah, player input here. So it already has the uh, generated class for you. And if we double click, we can check our actual maps. We have the player map UI we're not using. Uh, the move, I think, is the only thing I'm actually using here. And yeah, this is just the standard input action system here and our fire is just a button left button down there all right so on our on create for our system here what we're just doing is we're just instantiating um, a new default input actions. We need to enable it. Uh, and then we grab the actual action map for our player. Uh, we still have the require for update or just to make sure that we still have our player input and that we are in game. Otherwise, we don't need be grabbing our inputs for that. Uh, in the update, uh, we just make sure that the input system .update has been called just to make sure that we're we've got the latest um, input values. And then here we just assign uh, we grab the move read value or vector two to save it out into movement. Same for our look which I think is the mouse input, I think it is for this one. Uh, for our fire, uh, we just use was perform this frame just to get a bool for it. And then in our for each, we just grab a reference to our input data. We make sure that it is tagged with the uh, ghost owner is local component and then we just assign it to our player inputs here for the fire we want to call uh, dot set and this will just make sure that when it is set there's a counter uh, that gets set I wonder if we can We can look this up. Uh, here's our input event. This is is set. So when set is called here, it just calls uh, it increments this count. And when this gets sent by the send command system. Uh, this count uh, counter gets decremented every time it gets sent. So technically, this count could be more than one uh, if our uh, inputs are sampled higher than the actual frame rate or the tick rate. Okay, and... Then um, on our destroy, we just make sure that we disable the input. All right, and then the actual movement part, um, pretty standard here as well. This is running in our predicted simulation system group. And we just make sure that we have a player input here, uh, we could have made a speed component to put on our player if we wanted to control uh, how fast they, they are actually moving. I just hard coded it to four. It works well enough. And I didn't want to make more complicated code here. Uh, so here in our for each, 
uh, we're just grabbing our player input, uh, read only reference for it because we're not actually writing it, and our local transform uh, read write reference to that. And we just make sure that it is tagged with uh, the simulate. For our movement, uh, we just save our movement uh, from our player input into a float2. Uh, we just normalize it and then multiply it by our speed, which we set up top here. And then we can just grab our transform, set its position to a new float3. Easy stuff. Uh, here as well is we could have uh, grabbed our um, fire. So if we wanted to do something else with that, uh, we would just call the uh, input read only dot fire and then we would just check if it is set here Something just like if is set something, something, something. Do something. I don't know what. Uh, we could just debug log. Or maybe not. Oh yeah, because we're in a other thing. Anyways, we'll do something with that later. And we'll just come with that out. Think. All right. Uh, so yeah, that is basically what our movement is. We'll uh, fire this up. Make sure I didn't break anything. Okay, there we go. And we can move around. And we can drop a thin client. And move it around. So our spawning works. And our movement works. All right. So Next week, I guess, we'll get into physics, I guess. There's also um, pre-spawning ghost objects as well in your, in your scene view. So we'll probably get into a little bit of that as well. So yeah, if you guys um, have any other questions on that, definitely leave a comment below. And we will try to help you out. All right. See you next time.